Venga. Vamos allá. Muy bien. Sandra, el otro día no sé si estaba usted. Les pedí que grabaran en el ambiente de quirófano. No sé si estaba usted. Les pedí que grabaran en el ambiente de quirófano. Yo creo que estaba esta eh, Andrea, pero no me mandó los vídeos. Dígale que a ver si es capaz de enviarlos. Ah, ok. So, now we have this man who was in a urinary retention. He had a previous episode some years ago and uh, he went into retention again. And uh, three times they tried to take the catheter out. You can see that this is a catheter edema. Uh, this is uh, caused by the tip of the catheter. Uh, and uh, he had a negative uh, urine culture and we're going to uh, perform a uh, Moses uh, enucleation. So we're going to come out uh, to the apex and study the anatomy of the sphincter. You can see the contour. So I'm going to uh, choose to mark, you see, the limits between the apex and the sphincter, you see? That's the limit, and bring it down towards the veromontanum, and also uh, bring it up all the way, taking into account that the sphincter is tilting forward, you know, the anterior part is more proximal than the lower part, so our, our incision should follow, uh, let's say, the, the, the limits of the sphincter and the apex, but it should, uh, let's say, come a little bit more proximal as we go anterior. So as we go up, we should go in as well. Okay? That's the idea. These are the 12 o'clock fibers. So the 12 o'clock fibers, this is the veromontanum, that's the sphincter. Huh? You see the, the prosthetic shape varies a lot from one patient to the next. And uh, you have to adapt your incisions and uh, if, if you do them uh, too proximal, there's still a chance that the mucosa will break when you dissect the plane. But if you do it uh, right in the interface, right in the, in, the, in the edge, let's say, of the sphincter and the, uh, the noma, then it will be okay. No? So you see I'm cutting the attachments that uh, unite the sphincter with the apical prostate uh, in the dorsal area. So from from six to nine, uh, from six to nine, and from three to six, and then of course if you have good enough visibility, you can prolong this a little bit, coming up. And the, the the objective of this is not to look for the proper plane still, but to to generate this groove. You see, there is a groove between the sphincter and the prostate, and uh, that is going to be a very solid landmark to protect the sphincter. Very solid landmark to protect the sphincter, and uh, there we are. So we're going to push a little bit uh, near the veru. Huh? So this is very montano. I will put the tip of the scope here and do a little bit of lateral dissection, and a little bit of pushing forward to the tip of the scope to uh, find the proper plane. You see here, there's no stress for the sphincter because we are pushing a little bit lateral, but we have already generated the space. So we won't be breaking the, the sphincter in the lower part if we do a limited lateral motion to, to, to find the plane. There we are, so I'm going to cut now with the Moses fiber uh, to join one plane with the other. Here we are, joining the two sides into one single posterior plane. Now, once there's a small chamber here where I can put the scope and the fiber, I will uh, keep the fiber at 12 o'clock for the rest of the procedure. And I will establish the line of attack, and the line of dissection posteriorly, that is going to serve as a guide. You see, sometimes we don't see exactly 
I mean, distinguishing the plane is a little bit esoteric in the sense that, of course, here, for example, you can tell that we are in a good plane, but not always throughout the procedure you can tell exactly that you are in the good plane. Sometimes the tissue quality is a little bit different, but having the, the line of attack or the line of dissection as a uniform curved line, you know, this is a smiling, let's say, line, it helps us a lot because you might be not exactly in the proper plane, but uh, you're going to be very close uh, to that plane if you follow this uh, line of dissection. Normally, the uh, mechanical, let's say, shockwaves that the homium uh, produces will open the plane for you, so you have to, to point at a certain distance of the tissue that gives you a nice, you see, disruption of the fibers that are joining the capsule with the abnoma, and at the same time, you have to uh, make sure that it provides reasonably good hemostasis. You see, this plane is very beautiful. So this is a good thing because we have a good, uh, let's say, example of a good plane. And then, as I said, if you follow this line of dissection, even when the, uh, the plane is maybe not so clear here, huh? sometimes you can do a little bit of mechanical excursion, but I, I'd rather not do a lot of uh, mechanical dissection because there's usually no need. Huh? Only when you are in doubt, you know, and you can do a little bit of pushing with the tip of the scope to, to see if you're in the proper plane. But the, the concept of this uh, line of attack is quite good because, you see, it, it, it allows you to dissect a very uniform uh, plane. Here you can see the posterior aspect of the sphincter has already been released. And now to go anteriorly, I'm going to cut initially on the prostate, you see, on the prostate. Why? Because this is the sphincter. So if I cut following this plane, what I'm going to do is release it from the uh, apex of the prostate. Here we are reaching 12 o'clock. Here the incision is more horizontal. But now what happens when you go in, you see, we have gained a lot of access. This is the line I cut. But thanks to that, I can see now the proper plane much better and I have much better access. And I think this is a very paramount concept yeah? to incise the apex a little bit, to release it from the apex, and then it's very easy to find the proper plane. And also, as we come up with the scope, you see many techniques show you the, how the lateral lobe is dissected upwards, but nobody looks back to the sphincter to check what's going on. And, you know, I, I try to look back and do further incisions, you see, on the prostate, so we get better access to the, to the plane, you see, and, and this way, uh, what you do is you achieve to protect the sphincter completely, and you, you achieve to protect the mucosa of the sphincter, which is, I think, very relevant for a proper, uh, immediate postoperative urinary continence. Uh, this is 12 o'clock fibers. Here, you see, this is the limit of the sphincter. This is apical tissue. And here I'm cutting towards the 12 o'clock fibers here. It's interesting that we find these fibers when we enter let's say, the anterior plane. And we will find also vertical fibers when we exit the anterior plane and enter the bladder. So anteriorly, you have to look for the vertical fibers at 12 o'clock to enter the, the anterior plane, but also to exit the anterior plane and enter the bladder. Okay, so on the other side, we will do the same. You see here, you can see there's some attachments of the sphincter and the apex. So I'm going to do a cut on the tissue, you know, just to release the apical tissue a little bit from the from the sphincter and to and to generate some some space so when i go in i can look for the for the right plane you see here and i can try to follow the the right plane and uh, by generating that uh, let's say space i can put my scope in there and i can follow the plane very very carefully coming towards the anterior. You see here, I have to protect the sphincter also in this area. So here I'm going to cut horizontally into the prostate. I don't mind if this is the right plane or not, but I am taking the, the battlefield a little bit more inside towards the, the sphincter at 12 o'clock. Now, of course, I will go back to check 
the good plane you see here. And of course, we have better access to develop this plane. And we know that the sphincter lies a little bit behind, so there's less chances of damaging it. Yeah? Let's go. Let's proceed with this plane and this dissection. I'm going to go a little bit deeper, let's say, in here. So I can bring it up, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Yeah. Here, the, the tissue is obstructing my view, but I know that I'm in a good uh, position. I'm doing a good thing. Here, I'm, I'm reaching 12 o'clock again, and I'm reaching the 12 o'clock fibers again. You see, we, we can recognize this relatively easily. Here we are. Yeah, this, is the, this is the dissection of the anterior plane. I want to go now as anterior as I can, because the sphincter is lying behind us already, so I don't want to leave any anterior tissue hanging from the sphincter that could uh, lead to obstruction at some stage. So here you see we can come back to the, to the proper plane on the other side, develop it a little bit further and take the plane all the way anteriorly until I am able to, to connect, uh, let's say, with the other side here. We keep it horizontal. If, if you suspect we are close to the sphincter in a, in a certain point, But we are reaching the anterior plane that we did from the other side. So now we have managed to release the sphincter completely. Huh? There we are. So, again, coming up, coming up, coming up. Trying to follow this direction of the fibers of the capsule that are telling you uh, where to go. That's some apical uh, tissue. This is the connection with the plane on the on the other side. Yeah? Initially, the space is quite limited. You see, we have to let's say struggle a little bit uh, at the beginning. But I have to say, after this initial let's say five or six minutes or ten minutes, whatever it takes, you have a very nice uh, circumferential plane of dissection, and uh, the water is going to irrigate this. It's a space which is small at the beginning, but will get progressively larger and as we develop more and more uh, this plane. All right, so you see, having this line of attack allows you to continue with your dissection, and then the only worry is to go, let's say, too deep in the capsule. So we're going to make a, a dissection that is quite gentle, and so it allows us to judge if we are in the right plane or maybe too deep. And if we are too deep, you see, for example, here, you could tell I'm going a very deep, very deep. So just get a little bit more medial with your fiber and correct, you see, the dissection plane. Uh, doing, uh, let's say, violating the, the peripheral zone is not a problem uh, unless you continue with this capsular violation and you perforate it. Huh? So we have to stop before a perforation happens. That's uh, usually re relatively easy. Uh, if you, uh, let's say, progress uh, slowly and carefully, uh, and uh, you'll see that even when we progress relatively slowly, uh, this is a very fast uh, technique. Uh, here we are, dissecting the plane anteriorly, and checking the characteristics of the tissue. I'm trying to follow the curve, you know, we're not dissecting straight lines, we're dissecting a circumferential plane. So as I progress, I get closer to the to the adenoma. No? Let's go to the other side and see how this is now progressing. You see here, it looks like a good plane. I'm trying to follow the line. That might be a little bit deep, so I want to correct here, you see. It's not a big deal, you know, the fiber measures uh, only uh, half a millimeter, so leaving one millimeter more or less of tissue, it's not really relevant. When you look at the big picture, we are removing 80-90% of the anomatous, sorry, of the total volume of the prostate. So, of course, we don't want to leave uh, bulky amounts of uh, anomatous tissue, and we don't want to leave uh, uh, any nodule, you know, any anomatous nodule. But uh, these uh, minute Minimal irregularities from the from the capsule are not important. So 
this focus on the big picture, you know, follow your line of attack here. We haven't established a proper, uh, let's say, anterior plane. I'm going to try to establish a better plane so we can, let's say, put the scope on the adenoma and lower a little bit the, lower the, the adenoma and have a better visibility. Here, of course, I don't want to go, uh, let's say, too low. I'm going to try to stay up, stay up, you see, maybe it's, uh, and remove the, the anomatous tissue that could be sticking to the anterior part. But, uh, as I said, trying to establish a, an anterior plane. It's not, not very easy. There was a remnant of tissue there, but I, I corrected the plane to take it out. That looks a little bit deep, so we will stay somewhat low, lower. You see, it's a matter of judging, huh? of course, trying to recognize the proper plane, but when, when it's not evident, just follow the curvature of the prostate and judge if you're going too deep. Huh? At the end of the procedure, we will be able to judge if we left any significant amount of tissue. And there's a number of ways to do that. Huh? You have to look at the shape of the cavity. You have to see that there's no bumping, you know, remaining tissue there. And uh, also you can use uh, post-operative uh, or intraoperative ultrasound and transrectal ultrasound, as we do sometimes, to check the quality of the uh, fossa. Huh? Usually, despite having a relatively regular prosthetic uh, surface, when you do ultrasound, you realize that it was very anatomic and you were able to, to reach the, the proper plane in the proper depth, and there's no significant amount of tissue remaining. So, you see, we have to find a way to simplify HOLEP uh, so that everybody can learn it. I think I was in a congress, in the National Congress in Spain, and there was a German speaker discussing HOLEP, and he said, this is only for very talented surgeons, and if you are over 50, forget about it, because you will not be able to learn it. And I think that's a very discouraging statement. Uh, I think, of course, the free load technique is very demanding because you need very good orientation and starting to do the free load technique might be a little bit difficult. In this technique, maybe the challenging aspect is the apical liberation, but it's not so difficult to learn. It's very, very, let's say, structured, very, uh, how do you say, very reproducible and I have been teaching it to a lot of people and they are able to do it now. And they're extremely happy with their uh, end block uh, operations. And here, you see this is the, the bladder neck up here, and here we are at the uh, 12 o'clock area entering the bladder, all right? I'm not going to, to, to push it uh, uh, through for the moment. I'm going to try to make a, a little bit better dissection because the moment we enter the bladder, we will lose, uh, let's say, this excellent irrigation that provides us with excellent visibility. And I'm going to try to, to progress a little bit more on the lower aspect and connecting the lower aspect with the sides, the lateral aspects, before we enter the bladder. And then everything will be blazingly fast. When we open the bladder neck, we will be able to cut through the bladder neck circumferentially. And in a, in a very fast, we will finish the procedure. So you see, Holep, with this in-block approach and with this technology, so there's there's been advances not only in, in uh, technique, uh, this is surgical technique, but also in technology, we can get very, very consistent uh, hemostasis. Very consistent hemostasis. And uh, so here, yeah, that might look like a nodule. Now we have to check Sometimes you can check if you're going, if you're leaving tissue behind just by going carefully. Huh? Of course, if we see that the capsule gets very thin, we might, uh, let's say, refrain from doing this, but I think there was maybe a small adenoma of tissue there. Huh? Sometimes the, the fiber plastic, you see, gets uh, a little bit detached from the fiber and a little bit irregular, and it becomes a little bit uncomfortable. If that happens, you can get a pair of scissors and just cut the end of the fiber and, and continue with your procedure. I'm a little bit impatient. I always want to finish 
as early as possible. Um, sometimes I struggle with this uh, green uh, cling-ons. Uh, all right. So there we are. You see, this is lateral, 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 lateral. I'm going to try to follow that plane. Here, if we follow this plane, we're going to get towards the anterior part. So we must we must be nearing the, the bladder neck. That's um, tissue I'd like to remove as well. There's nothing wrong, you see. The same way when we were entering the capsule a little bit, we corrected. Uh, you can correct and we'll go back and take a little bit more tissue out if you think that uh, it's worth it. Sometimes it's difficult to say if this is going to be a nodule or what. Here, that's uh, getting deeper. We're getting towards uh, the bladder neck. And I think maybe, maybe let's do some more posterior dissection. Let's see how this is coming here. Let's analyze this a little bit better. As you get more and more confident with Polyp, you realize that uh, nothing happens. It's a very safe procedure when you get even a little bit close to the capsule. Sometimes when you remove these nodules, the capsule looks a little bit thin, but uh, usually it has no consequence. So when you do many cases, uh, you realize how safe this procedure is and uh, you don't tend to panic uh, when you see a little bit of capsule or a little bit of fat or a small perforation, just, uh, you know, relax. Of course, you have to recognize when something happens that is important, but what I'm trying to say is that your first reaction as a polyp surgeon cannot be panicking every time you uh, open a little bit the, the capsule. Huh? Uh, many times we do that with open prostatectomy, many times we do that with uh, TURP, you know. Although I haven't done a TURP or a open prostatectomy for many years, but I remember that sometimes you could see a capsule preparation. And of course, the reaction was a little bit panicky because you could open sinuses, there was a lot of bleeding, the situation was not, I mean, you were using, or we were using at the time, uh, not silane, but uh, uh, glycine or sorbitol, and uh, it was a little bit more dangerous. But now we are using uh, irrigation of silane, and uh, we're using a relatively low pressure to do this dissection. And we are using a laser that provides very good hemostasis, so it's pretty safe and calm and peaceful operation. Of course, uh, having the sphincter released completely and having the sphincter, and I will show you, in very good shape, you see. We respected the sphincter and the mucosa on the sphincter. I'm quite relaxed that uh, the patient will not have incontinence and uh, we... we, we uh, avoided that possibility from the very beginning of the procedure and I can continue my, my dissection very happy and very relaxed so there's nothing tremendous about polyp you know it's it's a pleasant operation it's very anatomical and then I, I have to tell you patients are extremely happy when you go to see the families the, the irrigation is not full of blood it's uh, usually clear or pinky and uh, the nurses in the in the words uh, like this procedure because they're not suffering like they were before when they had to irrigate patients after TURP. Uh, so really, I think uh, this procedure is, is amazing. You can treat uh, very old patients, very weak patients. Now we're going in the bladder. Okay, I'm perforating the mucosa uh, with, my, with my fiber. Now I'm cutting the bladder neck, you see, following the curve of, of the bladder neck, letting the energy do its job of cutting. You can see that Moses has enhanced, has enhanced the cutting properties of homium, so cutting fibers sometimes took a little while with homium, and now you can see that the, the cutting properties are greatly enhanced by, by the Moses uh, technology. So. Great idea, this uh, Moses uh, pulse modulation that uh, has improved uh, hemostasis, has improved uh, the reach of the laser in the sense that it 
you see opens the plane very beautifully, but it also uh, provides excellent hemostasis at the same time. So you can concentrate on the dissection aspect, you can concentrate on the plane, you can concentrate on the strategy and you don't have to think about controlling the bleeding, you know, so much because it's uh, usually controlled uh, as you go. So here we are, this is the posterior aspect, we're going around the prostate. I'm, I'm getting my fiber very close to the tissue so it doesn't disrupt the capsule, but just, you know, cuts the attachments of the capsule on the abnorma and provides excellent coagulation, but there's no capsular, let's say, violation or, or damage. Yeah? Here we are, you have to learn to navigate the, this, uh, this uh, cavity, you see it's a circumferential cavity. I tell my patients it's like an orange, the prostate is like an orange. We are dissecting, we're peeling off the meat of the orange from the skin of the orange. And once we finish, we will uh, take the meat, push it into the bladder and morselate it. There we are, this is the posterior aspect, this is bladder neck, so you see how we managed to reach very close here, uh, and uh, I'm going to stop at 6 o'clock because I don't want to cross over to the other side from, from this side, and we're going to check how is this bladder neck looking. You see, it's much less developed. So I'm going to come at 12 o'clock, and I'm going to follow the curve of the bladder neck to dissect it, let's say, towards the posterior aspect. You see, everything is uh, circumferential here. The bladder neck also, and I'm going to cut the bladder neck uh, following this uh, circumference. Like if I did a, a bladder neck incision here, and uh, that's the tissue I wanted to take out. There's probably some little attachment here. Let's see if I can connect this little plane here with uh, that area. I think I have to follow this direction to get to that, yeah, to get closer to the bladder neck, you see. So here we are incising still the bladder neck and separating the abnorma from the, from the capsule. There we are. There we are. Let's check the UO. There it is. So now, you see, we have the stinker, perfect stinker. We have the adenoma. I'm going to push it into the bladder if I can. Uh, for that, I have to lift the, the lobe and, and push it, you see? Many times you can push one lobe first, and then the other lobe will go easier, much easier. Uh, but here, there's still some attachment that is preventing me from tinting it completely. But you can see we have bladder neck up here, up here. So let's detach this a little bit. becoming much uh, easier. And then we have bladder neck here. So I'm going to cut the tissue here very progressively to make sure that we can uh, send the noma into the bladder in one piece. Let's end block. And the main advantage of this procedure, I think, is the early apical liberation and the uh, quality of visibility the fact that we are dissecting a very circumferential plane. This is retrofibrony, this is not the bladder, the bladder is up there. So let's continue in this uh, direction. And keep correcting the plane as we always do. Huh? We don't want to make a very big perforation. If we make a small one, it's not a big deal. There we are. There we are, cutting the mucosa from the lateral aspect to the midline. Huh? And that's the end of the enucleation phase, I think. There we go. I'm going to check a little bit the uh, hemostasis. You see that we lost the laminar flow that was giving us excellent visibility. Here, you see we were going a little bit deep up there. Uh, that's not, not perfect. So I'm going to remove, let's say, these hanging, hanging bits if I can, but we don't want to insist going deeper like that, just stay here. 
when I see this kind of, uh, let's say, thin, thin capsule like that, like what we have here, I'm not very concerned. I'm just uh, uh, checking from the stasis, uh, removing any additional piece of tissue. It went a little bit deeper than usual, and that's because you see the capsule interiorly is very thin. Uh, so, but here it's uh, holding very well. I think this is proper capsule, just a little bit flimsier there. Uh, no, no big deal. I will remove the catheter tomorrow as well. Uh, I don't tend to, to keep the catheter for longer. Even if we do a little bit of uh, thinning, thinning of the capsule. That's a small meter. It's hard to tell if this is uh, not tissue. I'll take it out just in case. So this is what I call the trimming uh, phase, where you check hemostasis and you check if something is remaining. That's why I don't care so much, you know, if if you uh, let's say if you if you leave a lot of a, a little bit of tissue, that's probably belonging to the ladder neck. But let's remove this a little bit. What I'm saying is, if you if you have to correct your claim. Don't worry if you, if you think that you went a little bit too much inside because we can check at the end if there's any remaining leakage tissue that needs to be removed. There we are. Huh? And so it was a very fast operation. We have a pretty good hemostasis. I'm going to check this uh, ladder neck area. Yeah, that's also a little bit in the limit. Esto no puede venir nadie, Sandra. No puede venir nadie a ayudar. Nos dejan otro quirófano. Ok. Vale, vale. Pues pidan aquí primero, o pidan, y luego vemos en cuál pueden ir primero. Ok, sorry for the uh, interruption. I was being asked to have another operating room available, so they were asking me if we can proceed to get another patient ready for the next procedure. But here we are, huh? sinker, posa, very nice. Uh, there's some areas where we are near the near the, the limit, but nothing very serious. If there is uh, starvation, it's going to be very little, and uh, surely non-clinically significant. Huh? We take the catheter out tomorrow morning. Okay, let's mostly. So I'm going to change my camera, connect it to the uh, nephroscope. Okay, change the light cable. And my nurse is going to uh, take out the endoscope. I'm going to help her. She's going to pull, and then I'm going to go in very fast so I don't decompress the bladder. Now my water inflow, my water inflow is a little bit, uh, it's open still because there was some, some water coming out and I will compensate there. Uh, that's the bladder neck, you see, here I am. I'm going to lift a little bit my hands so I can uh, keep the blades away from the bladder wall. And that's the motivation place. The perennial morselator is an amazing tool and uh, provides excellent morselation, very fast morselation, and uh, allows us to, to perform these procedures in a very limited time. So, polyp is no longer, or doesn't need to, to be, not, uh, no longer does need to be, is that correct to say that? Do I have water? I'm saying is that polyp, this is, uh, this is tissue or this is bladder neck, sorry. I mean the fossa, that's the thing. I'm a little bit confused because I came into the fossa. 
Now, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, polyp doesn't have to be a very lengthy procedure, full of stress, and uh, it's just a routine procedure. And uh, I don't tell my patients that they have a significant risk of incontinence because they don't have. Uh, I don't uh, teach them kegel exercises before the operation because they usually don't need them. So I think the block technique with early apical release is offering excellent postoperative continence rates and uh, there's very low incidence of uh, uh, postoperative stress incontinence. It is true that uh, removing the whole abnormal has a lot of benefits. Long-term durability, excellent deobstruction, excellent chance of recovering the bladder if it's a hyperactive bladder. But uh, there's also some drawbacks. Uh, some patients tell you, you know, I don't wear a pad, but if I am going to pass gas, you know, if I'm going to fart, uh, sometimes if I'm not careful when I relax the anal sphincter, I, I can feel as if a drop was coming out or maybe a drop comes out because the relaxation of the pelvic floor and the anal sphincter uh, relaxes the external sphincter as well, and they leak a little bit. But uh, when you ask them overall, they're usually very happy. So we finished the morselation, that's the sphincter. There we go, thank you.